Welcome to this episode of Patient Perspectives in HCV, a CE podcast series. If you are seeking continuing education credit, please review the front matter for disclosures and the requirements for successful completion of the activity prior to listening to the podcast. A link is found in the show notes that can direct you to this information. After listening to the podcast, please go to practice.cme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit. Thank you for your attention. The podcast will now begin. I'm Dr. Tony Martinez from the University of Buffalo in Erie County Medical Center, and I'm here with my patient of many years, Ms. Lindsay, and we're going to talk a little bit about her patient journey with Hep C. So in this first episode, uh, we'd like to focus, Lindsay, on your diagnosis and when you were diagnosed. How were you diagnosed? Okay. Um, So my first initial diagnosis was in 2016. Um, I was a patient of MAT treatment at the time, and I was going to a clinic, and I started a journey of trying to do treatment, Um, but at the time, I was still currently using, and I was in active addiction, Um, so it was kind of a struggle to me, and I wasn't really ready to accept my diagnosis. You know, I kind of felt like it was the end of the world. um, And I continued to use for a few years after that, um, behind that, one of the many reasons why I was still using. So you knew you had hep C, but you continued to use drugs Yes. and just try to put it behind, you know, not focus on it. How old were you at the time? Um, I would have been 33. About okay. to turn 33. That's when you, you were 33 when you were diagnosed? Yes, uh-huh. yes. Um, so it was just a struggle for me. Um, like I said, I didn't want to accept the fact that I did have it. Um, you know, they did tell me my levels at the time. I can't exactly remember. Um, and then I had actually became incarcerated and in a little bit after my diagnosis. And, you know, when you go into incarceration, they test you again and they pulled me out and told me that I did have it again. Um, and after that, I did get out and I continued to use. Yeah. So, and treat, was treatment ever offered to you while you were incarcerated? Um, no. Um, treatment was offered to me at the clinic that I was going to before incarceration. For your MAT? Yes. And, um, but the problem was is that they wanted me to not be actively using. So at the time when you were, that's interesting because the guidelines have completely changed right. and there's no more period of abstinence or sobriety. Right. And I mean, that's not that long ago that, that you were facing this and it's interesting that they were still holding to that guideline and that right. period of abstinence really makes no sense. I mean, Mm -hmm. it never made any sense. And thank God, in a lot of places, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so that was a major barrier then for you. Right, right. Um, And then not too far along after that, um, you know, I, I actually um, considered, you know, switching providers um, to go and try and see if I could get treatment. Um, In 2018, um, I did go to a rehab facility and they brought it back up again. Um, And I was still on MAT at the time. And so I went to a provider and I had my initial consult. And then I ended up relapsing and going back out again. Um, It wasn't until August of 2018 when I went to another facility um, when I came home from that facility, um, I actually linked with your office. And that's when we kind of began our uh, our adventure. Right. So when you first went to that provider who for evaluation of the hep C, mm-hmm. you know, were you comfortable talking about the whole thing, how you acquired it? Were you comfortable in that setting? Um, you know, at the at the clinic that I was at? Yeah. Um, no, I felt judged. Um, you know, and it, it probably was in my head, honestly. Um, but I just felt like people looked down on me. Yeah. And so it was really hard for me to talk about it. Um, I didn't want to tell my family, my relationships with them was, were already, you know, um, broken Strange. and skewed. Yeah. And they really, you know, my mom always talked to me no matter what. Um, but I just felt like, 
I kind of had like a stigma on me yeah. almost, um, you know, and already being an active addiction, it was just, you know, I always felt less than when I was in active addiction. Um, but, you know, doing my program that I do now and stuff, you know, and going back and looking on the past, you know, I realized that that was just a facade, like it wasn't real. Um, but it's, I think it's really hard for people, especially when they're in active addiction, to come to terms with things. I mean, they're already struggling having, being addicted to certain substances. Um, and a lot of times people feel like there isn't a lot of help out there. Yeah. So. And when, when you were diagnosed, you're going through all of this stuff, how much did you know about hep C? Um, I really didn't know too much about it. Um, you know, I did know that like people would get it and from like using dirty needles for tattoos and, you know, sharing needles and stuff like that for injecting um, IV drug use. Um, I, I had questions, you know, because I wasn't living the best lifestyle. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that I couldn't pass it to people, stuff like that. Um, so I did ask some questions, um, but I don't really think at the time that it was really, the information wasn't given to me properly. Um, yeah, and that's something that we hear a lot, that a couple of things that you pointed out that I think are really important. You know, a lot of times people who are using drugs with hep C, a lot of times providers will say things like they don't want to engage in treatment or they, they have trouble motivating patients to start treatment. And in a way, it's almost... Uh, it's, it's the narrative that they give patients isn't always the right one. Mm -hmm. And I think what you mentioned about not wanting to pass it to somebody is really important because when we know that when we talk to patients, one of the number one concerns that people who are using have is giving the hep C to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're a young female. Uh, do you have children? I have two. And will you were you diagnosed before the pregnancies or after? Um, I was diagnosed after the pregnancy. Um, so I didn't have it. My, my oldest child, you know, she's going to be 17. My youngest is going to be six in July. So I found out after. Yeah. Um, but I was, you know. And did that ever enter your mind that you may have passed it to the children? Um, you know, I wasn't sure about, I was really worried about my younger child, um, but I, in my head, you know, I thought that they would have noticed by then um, yeah. because I got into MAT when I found out I was pregnant with her. Right. So, um, and it wasn't until after she was born that they did diagnose me. Um, was she tested? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I bring this up is because we know in the U.S. there's two and a half million people that still have hep C. And for a long time, the baby boomers were the focal point. And we've seen in the past, you know, five or seven years that it's the demographic is completely changed. And it's younger people under age 40 that we're seeing really that uh, primarily have hep C now. Mm -hmm. And part of that demographic change has also been patients just like you who are younger females. Uh, and we've seen increased rates of vertical transmission, meaning passing from mom to baby. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big concern for a lot of us, which makes it all the more important that we engage, you know, young women who may be using into care for right. the hep C. Um, talk to us a little bit about the addiction itself. You know, a lot of this stuff, hep C, uh, things that come downstream are directly related to the actual addiction. And a lot of the stigma that you mentioned, I think, is driven by the substance use, you mm -hmm. know, and how you acquired the hep C. Do you mind telling us how you started with, with substance use and what kind of, where do you think it stemmed from? Um, so I, you know, when I was younger, I experimented like, you know, a lot of kids do. Um, you know, I was given up for adoption when I was born. I was raised by a separate family. Um, and I had a good loving home. Um, when I was probably about 12, you know, I, I tried marijuana first. Um, it wasn't like an everyday thing or anything like that. Um, but when I got older and I got into high school, I played sports and um, I had to have surgery. And when I was 17, I had foot surgery on both my feet and I was prescribed prescription opiates. Um, and from that point on, 
you know, I took them as prescribed. My parents gave them to me the way the doctors told them to. Um, and then I was in a car accident, a couple, actually two accidents. And from that point on, I got into pain management and I was prescribed a very high amount of prescription opiates. Um, all the doctors that I did see for my prescriptions ended up getting in trouble by the DEA, um, which, for you know, prescribing. for over prescribing. Um, I went to two separate doctors and then I went to another one. And when I was in pain management with that um, said doctor, they ended up cutting me off because I tested positive for marijuana. Um, by that point though, you know, my whole life had completely changed. I had my first daughter. I was on prescription opiates with her. So you were dependent on those opiates at this point. And I didn't even realize it at that time because yeah. I never went without them. Right. Um, my lifestyle changed though. And the people I hung around, um, you know, my habits changed and unfortunately, you know, because of the lifestyle I was living, um, you know, I was buying them off the street. And then from that point on, um, you know, I realized that like, this is becoming a problem. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to change it because I enjoyed the way it made me feel. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize until later on in my life that, you know, addiction was genetic. Um, my biological father, also participated in the same things that led me down the same dark road. Yeah. Um, we actually met throughout my addiction and we actually used together. Um, but I didn't use IV drug use until I was 28 years old. Um, you know, so it was a long period of oral based pain meds, opiate based pain meds from 17 to 28. Um, but I wasn't necessarily taking them orally, I was sniffing them. Okay. Um, probably in about 23 or 24 is when I started, you know, um, using the Opanas, I was prescribed, but then, you know, we discovered that you could break them down and sniff yeah. them. So, you know, it just progressed and, you know, me trying other drugs progressed because, I said, I would never stick a needle in my arm. That was my biggest thing was like, oh, I'm not an addict because I'm not, you know, out doing certain things and um, partaking in certain lifestyle changes, even though my lifestyle was getting worse. Um, you know, I was blinded by the drugs. Yeah. Um, and I went in and out of institutions, whether it be rehabs, jail. Um, I lost my children. I lost my daughter over it. Um, she went to go stay with my family and then you know, at 28 years old, I was really, really sick one day and um, I was, sick. A, yes. And I was in a house and everybody was using there and a girl was there and she was going to shoot up a fentanyl patch. And she said, I could get you on sick. And I said, well, I don't do that. And I have no idea how to. And she's like, don't worry, I'll do it for you. And I stuck my arm out and it was over after that. That was it. It was done. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that why am I wasting all my money on these other pills when I could just buy heroin and which it's is cheaper. cheaper, more accessible, right. more obtainable. Right. Yeah. And we see that this is a, a trend that we just hear time and time again, you know, where you, you initiate with oral opiates. And we know that in 2017, I think it was something like a hundred million Americans were prescribed opiates and 10% of them somewhere between eight and 12% develop opiate use disorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of people when you do the math, right? right? And we hear this time and again that they initiate with oral-based pain medication, something happens, they become dependent, but then they escalate to injecting. And it's just this, you know, terrible like cycle that we see right. when people realize that getting things like heroin and fentanyl nowadays is more available, it's right. cheaper, you know, and that's when the, the injecting escalates. I do think one thing that you mentioned is really critical for an audience listening to this. And you said that addiction is genetic. And I think that that is probably one of the key things that I hope people take away from this is that in the United States, a lot of times we moralize addiction, right? It's a choice. It's a weakness. It's a moral failing. You opt to do it. And 
when you think about and listen to what you've just described, I don't think anyone chooses that. No. You know, nobody wants that. If no. you had a choice, you would stop it immediately and 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 it'd be over. Right. You know, you don't choose to lose your children. You don't choose to be in, you know, a, a use house getting shot up with somebody or using drugs with your biological dad. Right. No one chooses that. And addiction is really multifactorial, right? Mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of reasons why people start and there's, biological things that are uh, factors, there's socioeconomic factors, there's cultural things, there's so many layers to it that it's not so simple just to say that it's a choice. Right. Uh, do you think that's a, a fair statement? Oh, definitely. Um, I think, like I said before, the stigma, um, and the stigma is the last to go. Um, and it's to a point where, you know, like I said, I was raised in a good household. Um, I was raised with morals and values. You know, I went to school, I went to college. Um, you know, I had goals, I had dreams, I had aspirations. Um, that was one of the reasons why I was given up for adoption when I was born was because my mom that had me could not afford to take care of me. She already had kids and my dad was an addict and she didn't want to be with him anymore. So she gave me to a family that she knew. And, you know, it ended up that I met my whole biological family through drugs and jail. And I met my sister, my dad, my aunt, everybody through that lifestyle. Yeah. And I had no idea. Um, and, you know, I was always told I was adopted, but I didn't know the reason behind it. I just knew I was adopted, you're special, and we love you. And that's how my family raised me. Um, and then to go from that to meeting this whole other side of my family, um, you know, it just kind of blew me away. Um, my outlook on it is that, you know, I have a higher power and I believe that God had a plan for me um, and everything happens for a reason. So, you know, I've just kind of ran with that and changed And you've my come up, you've life. come so far and we're going to hear more about this journey. And in our next segment, uh, we're going to learn more about the hep C component of this, but okay. um Stay with us, join us on the next segment, and we're going to talk more with Lindsay uh, in, in our next part about her, her journey uh, being diagnosed with hep C. Thank you for listening. Please go to the activity page on practicepointcme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit.